Prayer is a necessity that you cannot live without. But the discipline of prayer is something that we all struggle with because at some point we all suck at praying consistently. In this video, I want to share with you about the discipline of prayer, which is the consistent practice of praying. In Luke chapter 18 verse 1, we see Jesus admonishing disciples that men ought always to pray and not lose heart, which is it is necessary to pray. It is something to not take for granted. It is something to not bargain with. And the truth is, in our daily life, there are so many things that try to draw our attention away from God. So many things that try to choke our devotion to God. A lot of things happen in life that tries to get you tired of praying or somehow get you to feel like praying doesn't work. Because when you're disappointed in life, you pray to God about the thing and it didn't work out, you might just feel like, what is the need of praying again? But in this video, I want to unveil to you why you pray. Because that is important for you not to feel frustrated when you pray. Because if you don't understand the reason you pray, you might just ask yourself, why am I even doing this? You know, the framework we have around prayer has been from our upbringing and our environment, the church and our parents. So this framework forms our point of view concerning prayer. And most of it are things that if you consider squarely, they will actually make you limited towards having a disciplined life of prayer. I grew up seeing my mom pray and she always kneel beside her bed to pray maybe when she's going to sleep or when she's waking up in the morning. I could actually feel like I need to always find a place to kneel before I can pray. In the church, I was told when growing up, you need to close your eyes so that you can pray because you're not here to look at people. And I'm like, okay, I need to always imbibe the habit of closing my eyes before it is a prayer that God can answer. And there are deeper things other than these just shallow ones that I share that has to do with our belief system concerning prayer, which could actually make us not be able to build a disciplined life towards prayer, which is have a consistent praying life. And those are the things I want to consider. The truth is, if you would have a better option other than God to survive and do well in life, you would not need God. And if God were to be an option, you may not choose God. But since God is not an option, that is why you need to pray. Because the way to reach God is through prayers. You cannot reach him any other way. So in this video, I want to go to the first thing I want to consider, which is praying feels weird. I used to feel shy and weird about prayer. Because I did not actually know what it meant to pray. How am I sure that I'm not just talking to myself? How am I sure that God will hear me? And apart from thinking about if God hears me, how am I sure he's going to answer? And then Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 says, Call unto me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things which you do not even know. That is such a great assurance to tell me when I pray. Even though it's something that might feel weird to my flesh but God is real and God hears. Why prayer would always feel weird is when you don't have a personal understanding of God. That is where I was as I was growing up because I did not have a personal understanding of God but I was always motivated to pray because prayer used to be like if you don't pray you might get into harm's way. Though that may not really portray what it means to pray but then that was the motivation that was given to pray. But in reality, it used to feel like, is it that the way we pray against the devil, that he is superior to God? Because sometimes the way people carry fear to make prayers to God, it's as if the devil is up again to do this, to do that. And I'm like, who is in charge? Who is the superior? So this makes praying that way feel weird. There are actually four things to consider about the weirdness of prayer, which makes people to become too ashamed to pray or too afraid to pray or too proud to pray or too weak to pray. When you talk about being ashamed to pray, I used to be there. My mom had this habit of sometimes you're sleeping, she would just come to you and lay hands and start praying. Sometimes she might carry the olive oil and start anointing you and do things. I used to feel so weird. Why did it feel weird? She did not sit me down to tell me, son, this is why I pray for you. This is why it's important. This is why it's necessary. I did not know that prayer is necessary. So I used to ask myself like, is this really necessary? Mom, is it necessary for you to do all of this? And it only took until I grew up to get the revelation about prayer for me to know that prayer is necessary. Because prayer to God 
is what fuels my relationship with him. That is how I put my faith to practice, which is my prayer is not just the time that I go on my knees to talk to God. My prayer is not just based on me going to God to ask something when I need one. My prayer is based on having fellowship with God, whether through worship, through reading of the word, because if I don't get to know the character of God, I will always be ashamed to go to God. So how did I get over the weirdness of me being ashamed to pray or be prayed for by my mom? It's when I got to the revelation knowledge that prayer is very necessary for my life. I need prayer. I don't just need to pray. I need prayer from people. I need my mom's prayer. I need my dad's prayer. I need my sibling's prayer. And this gave me the inspiration to tell myself when I get to have kids, it is something that I will have to sit them down and make sure that I remove the weirdness of prayer by explaining to them this is what prayer is. This is why it is necessary. And when I do that, I'll be praying for them because now I can see what my mom did was good. The only thing is that I felt weird because I did not get an understanding. But growing up to get it, I embrace every prayer she says with a loud amen wherever I find myself. Because most of the time, when I used to find myself in public places and then she would pray on the phone, I would be like, wow, this woman have come again. <laughs> Being too afraid to pray. Why are you too afraid to pray? Because you are like, what if I pray and the answer is not favorable? Then you are in God's will. If the answer doesn't come as you think, then you are to be grateful that you reached out to God and you are in God's will. Because I know as humans, what might cause that is us not trusting that God has our best interests at heart. It might just be us thinking that I know what is best for me. And that is trying to be independent of God. And that is where people get into trouble. Because when you think you are wise in your own understanding, that is what Proverbs says, do not lean on your understanding. And most times, we find ourselves leaning on our understanding, trying to do things before we invite God in. Are you too proud to pray? And what do we say to those that are too proud to pray? It is someone saying, everything is going well for me. My family is doing well. I don't really need prayers. Because the mindset that prayer is for people that are struggling and suffering might actually hoodwink you to think you don't need one. No matter how rich and wealthy you are, you need protection. And the security you can gather around yourself cannot protect you. The Bible says, if the Lord does not guard a city, the watchman is watching in vain. So if God is not protecting your life, you are doing that in vain. You come to a place of being like a bird that will be trapped in a net or like a fish that will be caught. So you don't need to be in such a place, which is you always finding yourself at the wrong place at the wrong time. And it is only God that can place you in the right place at the right time. Your money cannot place you in the right place at the right time. But how do you get to fill this relationship with God. It is true prayer. Get to know more of him because prayer is not a monologue of you just going to tell God, God, I need protection. Now you've given me money. Just give me protection now. No, it is for you to go to God, to commune with him, to connect with him, to become deeper with him in your relationship such that you can understand his character. Do you feel too weak to pray? That's one of the weirdness of prayer. And you're like, I can't pray the whole night. Sometimes I just feel tired. When I start praying, I fall asleep immediately. Don't stop praying. Yeah, even if immediately you start saying in the name of Jesus and you fall asleep, keep doing that. Because at some point, don't allow the weirdness to catch up with you such that when you find yourself awake again and you're like, oh, I was praying and you start feeling guilty. Don't allow the guilt in. Because praying can feel so weird. And you are a human being. You have to form a habit of making it very intentional because when it starts feeling boring, when you start praying, you could feel too weak to pray. Or maybe you start praying and you don't have words again to say. You could feel too weak to pray. And if you are in this place, you have to understand that your prayer is not in your eloquent words. Your prayer is not in how many things you can say to God. I had an experience that in the corporate church, when they will say a prayer and everybody's praying, at some point, I was feeling like, can my voice really go through for God to hear? Because at that time, I did not really get an understanding of this personal revelation of me knowing that my prayer is personal between me and God. So it was like everybody's in church and everybody's trying to pray. Everybody's trying to get loud. And how will God hear my own? Because I'm listening to my neighbor standing right beside me. And it feels like 
Their prayer is so eloquent. There's no way God will not answer this prayer because they are aligning their words very well. And I am here not even knowing what to say again after saying the line of the prayer. And you have to know prayer is about your faith in God. You don't need to say words as if you are trying to convince God in a debate. God, I want you to see reasons why you should do this. Because you are the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You can do that, but that's not for you to whine God. That is for you, yourself, to remind yourself who God is. Every name you call God is not to hide God. Every name you call God is to bring your consciousness to faith that this God is powerful, that he's awesome, that he can do these things you're asking of him. The number two consideration is why do you pray? Your prayer is to align your desires with the will of God. Jesus said in the book of Matthew when he was teaching the disciples about prayer that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when you pray, you're telling God your will be done in my life regardless of what I want. Hey, that's serious. That's deep. That's something that in our human flesh doesn't feel so good. But to the Spirit of God, that's the kind of prayer God wants. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was telling the Father, I wish that this cup would pass by, but not as I will. Your will be done. That was where the change came. Because if you come to God in this relationship, and just want to come to him whenever you need something from him. It is a toxic relationship that you have with God. It is just as having a relationship with someone, whether friendship or an intimate relationship. And you are always going to them only when you need something. You only want to communicate with them when you need something. That is toxic. That is unhealthy. You are a parasite. Because you are not building connection with this person. Which means you don't regard this person. You don't take them serious. You're just trying to use them and you can't use God because God knows your heart. So when it comes to you coming to God in prayer, it is you presenting your request to God and asking God, this is what I want, that your will be done. Not as I want, but your will be done. David said one prayer in Psalms 139 that is so powerful to me. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. This is so powerful because it portrays what the prayer you make to God looks like. Whenever you are praying to God, it is you coming to God with your request. It is not you coming to God with your command. As if you are in charge. Just telling God, go and do this and do that for me. You need to know who is in charge here. God is in charge, you're not. God's will is the best for you. Even when you don't think it is, it still is the best for you. Your feelings don't have to agree that God has your best interest at heart. You only need to align with God and be in the right direction for God's will in your life to be fulfilled. Because the more you delay asking for God's will, the more you delay your destiny. So now, who is the problem here? It is you. God is not telling you not to plan. But he says, plan. But I'm the one to decide what is going to happen. So whenever you pray, in the name of Jesus. That's the filter for your prayer. Will this glorify God? Will this be a blessing to you and give honor to God? Prayer is not for you to inform God, but to inquire of God. David in First Samuel chapter 30, when he went for war with his men and came back and his family was taken captive and the city was burnt down. He would have just in anger just said, let's arise, try to motivate the soldiers. Let's go and fight back and take back our possession. Like sometimes we rise up in our flesh and just try to do things because we think we are wise. We think we know what to do. We think we are capable. And David did not do like that. He went to God and said, God, should I go? Should I pursue? Not just that. Will I succeed at this? This is to tell you, whenever you pray, you are not praying to inform God of anything. God knows everything that you want to do. He knows your heart. He reads your heart. But you are praying to inquire of God. And that's how you should pray. That's why you should pray, which means you don't go find someone you want to date and bring the person to God and tell him, I just want to inform you that this is the person I want to date. As if you're doing that to your parents, that's not how you do to God. You can choose whoever you want to date and want to marry and take them to show your parents if they agree or not. But when it comes to God, you have to let God decide what's best for you, which is you are inquiring of him. God, I want to date this person. Should I? Should I not? If I do. Will it be good? What do I do when I do this? If you want to get married, you ask God, should I get married to this person? 
Should I not get married to this person? And this is when you align with God's will, which is your character, your conduct. You should do what is right. It doesn't mean you go into a relationship, for example, and you're not trying to do everything right, but you are tiptoeing. You're not fully committed. You're tiptoeing and then you're saying, oh, it wasn't just God's will. No, do all you're supposed to do. But then ask God for his will. Do the right thing that honors God. Put God at the center and tell God, should I continue with this or should I not? I want to do this contract, God, but I want to inquire of you. Is this going to bring me profit? Is this going to be good for me? Is this going to go wrong? If not, show me. So it is you inquiring of God, trying to get more information, trying to get direction, trying to allow the Spirit of God to be your compass, trying to allow the peace of God to be your compass, which is you telling God, if this is not going to be good, don't give me peace in this. That's a powerful prayer. And that is why you pray, so that you can have direction, so that God can teach you and show you what to do. It is not for you to go and inform God. This is what I want to do. So I'm just coming to tell you. I don't know what you think about it, but I've already made up my mind. And that's how a lot of believers pray, which is why we don't get answers from God. The number three thing is that prayer is a love commitment to God. It's a dedicated act that you have because of this intentional relationship that you have with God. It is not something that you just do because you are doing it to get something from God. It is not for you to do it as a means to an end. It is for you to pray because you are intentional about getting to know more of God. So when you see prayer as a love commitment to God, you keep doing this knowing that God loves you. You're not just praying to a God you do not know. You're praying to a God that you are certain of his character. You know who he is. You know he answers prayers. You know he loves you. So lastly, where do you pray? Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew chapter 6 when he talked about prayer, whenever you want to pray, go into your closet, close the door behind you and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will answer you openly. And sometimes this could be turned to look like build a closet in your house, make a prayer altar there and be praying to God. My argument with that is somehow people tend to idolize these things, which is you build an altar in your home a secret place. You don't want anybody to step into that place. If anybody ever has to stumble on there, maybe you're a parent, your child has to go play there, your anger will just go up. And you're like, why would you play there? This is a secret place. This is this and that. And you'll be angry. Now, what am I trying to say? Am I trying to condemn people that have an altar, a place, special place to pray in their house? No. But all I'm trying to say is, if you don't have a special place, there's no condemnation either. It is just for you to realize that God did not say, pray here or pray there. He says, pray always. Men always ought to pray, which is sometimes you'll be in your office. Make that your altar. Sometimes you'll be on the road. Make your altar there. And how do you make this? The Bible says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, which means in the temple is where you find the altar. So if your body is the temple, your heart is the altar. That is why God said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Because when your heart is pure, which is your altar, you can see God, you can communicate with God, you can have this pure relationship with God, you can have this conversation with God and know that God listens to you, He hears you, and you can hear Him talk back to you. That is why the scripture keeps on telling us that we should be holy as our Father in heaven is holy. So it is not about a special place in your home or a special place anywhere. It's about making your heart pure instead of getting your heart defiled, but making sure that you cleanse your heart for you to be able to communicate with God. Because your brain to God is for you to have this privacy of communication with Him, whereby you have this uninterrupted flow of listening to Him and He speaks to you. And at that point, you need to know that it's about quality time, leaving some things out. But on the discipline part, it's about always praying wherever you are. It's about always praying wherever you are. Whether in the office, whether in church, at home, whether on your bed, whether on your couch, whether in the kitchen, as you're cooking, you're praying. God hears. Whether in your bathroom, God hears. Most times I get some inspiration more when I'm in my bathroom because my mind is clear. You just need to cultivate this discipline of making sure you reach out to God, you talk to God, you hear God, you enjoy this fellowship with Him. 